So, um, my name is Robert, and I have a Twitter account because that's the hipster thing to do now. Um, and considering that um, the table is kind of, you know, restricting both, both my movement and my ego, I will just kind of move around a bit. Um, so, I'll just, I'll just give you context a little bit what, 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 what we do as a company, actually. Um, you know, because I don't really have a lot of CV. And um, so I'll explain a little bit to you my environment. Um, this is my environment, actually. This is just an excuse to put a picture of Paris. Because, <laughs> you know, I currently live in Paris. Um, and I would also like, because uh, this talk will actually kind of rely a little bit on, on, on you, like actually answering questions. And I personally have an issue with the whole European thing of, you know, like, oh, I am not going to answer this question because I'm afraid it's a thing. So basically, what will happen is if I ask a question, it will be a yes no question. If you have your hand up, that means yes. If you have your hand down, that means no. So we will test this. Do you like pasta? Yes. Good. Okay. <laughs> um, so I come from a company called Pritium. Uh, we have like a, around 1 billion internet users. Um, we're an ad tech company and we have around um, 1,800 employees out of which 300 engineers and uh, 27 offices around the world with three that have research and development. So we're always on the lookout for talented people, you know, I and mean, this is why they paid me to come here. So. Um, but what's, what's actually what I want you to get from this slide, you know, this is not only a shameless plug, it is also um, a kind of opportunity for you to see that, you know, we have 300 engineers and we are a team of 12 doing like exclusively chef, but there are also other teams that rely on us, that rely on our code. There are also other teams that actually don't use our chef service. They have their own chef service, but they use our cookbooks that we provide. And um, this is because um, we have around 15,000 uh, physical nodes in seven data centers. Actually, it's eight data centers because Paris is two, but it's logically It's complicated. And across three, con uh, three continents, we have three billion uh, displays a day, and we get a peak at around two million HTTP requests per second. So um, we, we, we kind of, you know, get some traffic around the world from time to time. Last time, we managed to misconfigure the um, the GOIP um, load balancing in DNS, and then we kind of, you know, invert the traffic between New York and San Diego because it happened. And um, we have a kind of a big Hadoop cluster of 40 petabytes, and I think we have the largest um, carriage-based cluster in Europe. It's not that large, I think it's only around uh, 350 nodes. So, um, we, we, we have, you know, um, issues, and we need to solve these issues, and um, this, is, this is why you kind, of, you kind of stumble into testing, whether you like it or not. You know, it's because, you know, when we used to start configuration management, and like years back and stuff like that, and then what you would do is, you know, you would have, have like, a, like a dev server, and then you would like, you know, run stuff on the dev server, and it was like, oh, it works, now I'll put it in prod, because it works on the dev server, which is absolutely the same as my prod, you know. Um, so this talk has been actually converted from, from being a workshop. And I have an example, and the example is um, actually very, very um, simple in those terms. We will use Chef BK, uh, Chef because I like Chef, and we're a Chef shop and stuff like that. We use Vagrant and VirtualBox, and um, we will do this. This is what our cookbook will do. It will render a file containing the sum of all attributes under numbers. Does anyone know what chef attributes are? Uh, okay, yeah, so at least I have one. So basically they're variables. You put something in a variable, it gets applied on the system. We will sum numbers, okay? Think about that. And we will actually do the whole testing for that. We will start with unit testing. This is how Volvo, by the way, tests their um, you know, security seatbelts and stuff like that. 
because they're into unit tests, unit testing, because you know they kind of want not to kill people, because that's bad. But I've been told so. I don't know. I come from the Balkans, so um, we'll start with. Um, we, so we have the metadata. We know what the cookbook will do, and the people here who know Chef uh, will first do what Chef people. There was one there. What would you do first? What would you do first? Like you're writing a chef cookbook, what would you do first? I would uh, write a test, uh, a test in uh, ChefSpec. Good. <laughs> proper, proper answer. So we'll, 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 we'll use a tool called ChefSpec, and it's basically an extension of, of RSpec, because um, Chef is actually a Ruby gem, you know, that's all dirty secret, secret, it's still a Ruby gem. And it uses RSpec, and Chef Spec is kind of extends that. So what we'll do is we will have a spec helper. And in this spec helper, I will define my system. And I will say that my system is a CentOS 6.7. And that's about it. It works on Windows as well. Um, trust me, I had the unfortunate um, experience on that platform as well, because we have around uh, 4,000 Windows machines as well. And, uh, and I will write a test. And it will do, it will call the cookbook render and the recipe default. It will set up a chef solo runner. So basically, chef runs in two stages. It runs the compile phase and it runs the convert phase. In the compile phase, it actually gathers all the attributes, you know, all the information it can gather about the system and, you know, it will compute all these attributes. And in the convergence, what it will do is it will actually apply it. And chef spec will actually run everything except the methods that actually apply the stuff on the file system. So it's, you kind of mock everything except the actual putting the file on the file system. And at the end, it checks if the file is created. So it expects the chef run to create a file called TMP render file. Okay, will this fail? So everyone thinks that this will not fail. There's one who thinks that this will fail. There's two who think that this will fail. Do I have a three? Do I have a three? Come on, come on. This will fail because we have absolutely no code. We have not written any chef code. This test has to fail. And why it will fail? Because it expected the file with an action create to be in the chef run, and it's not there. Now, what I want you to see is that this actually runs really fast. It, it took less than a second. This is very important because if, if you remember, you know, the whole process we had before where we uploaded the stuff on our dev computer and then the dev computer took like, you know, I don't know, two minutes to upload, five minutes to run and stuff like that. This is one second. So I'll write the file. Will this pass? I don't want nodding. I want hands in the air. Will this pass? Yes or no? Yes, okay, fair enough, it will pass. I agree. So I'll write another, another test, okay? Because we said that we want to run a cookbook that will add up all the numbers. So what I'll do is in my chef run, I will set an attribute, you know, inside namespace render, I will set an attribute called numbers. It's numbers one, two, and three. As we all know, you know, it, it should add up to six. I mean, I, I really do hope it will. And we will expect it, expect the run to create a file, TMP render file, with the content 6. Now, this is continued. Okay, so, so, so the, you know, we're still running the other test as well, remember that. Will this fail? Yes or no? Yes. Fair enough. It will fail. Because the content was nil. We didn't write any code. That was an easy one, you know. I mean, you know, before I... To be quite honest, you know, you already had it like going there, and uh, that was just like. So we'll write something, and we will say that the content is numbers. We do a simple reduce uh, here, so basically, you know, we apply plus some numbers, and then we'll convert it to a string. Will this fail? Yes, yes. Why will it fail? Where didn't I set the attribute? I set it here. That's a test. It sets the attribute. 
with a fail, it will fail. Because in the first test, I don't have any default attribute set. And because I have no default attribute set, it will actually fail because it cannot operate, the reduce cannot operate on a nil. Because I do one ship run, and then I test if the file is created, and I do the second where I set the attribute, then it fails. And then that one, that one will pass. So actually you got it right the first time. Yeah, I'm sorry, it happens. Um, so this is what I have to do. You would not normally do this in Chef, but there are situations where you will need to do this. You will need to check if your attributes are properly defined that you actually can do a simple Ruby reduce on that. And this is, this is what happens, in, in, uh, unfortunately, in real life. So, um, what do you actually test with Chef spec? Well, usually when you test you know, unit testing with Chef spec, you test kind of um, your own defined resources, your own defined kind of Ruby code. So we use it a lot for, for example, we have, uh, we use also Rondek. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's, it's kind of an orchestration management workflow too, whatever. And we use Chef, we define a job in Chef and it gets uploaded to Rondek via the file import utility, whatever. And all of this is actually is actually mocked in Chef spec. We have an API, uh, we, have, we, ba we basically mock the API, we return like an HTTP um, answer and everything, and this is all done in Chef spec. Why? Because it really is quite fast. Uh, not only that, if you want to do, uh, for example, Ruby libraries, uh, some people may know that if you want, you can actually monkey patch Chef because it's Ruby. You should not do it, but you can do it, and we do do it. And then you can test that kind of hackish stuff there in Chefspec as well. So this, this was, this was, so this, I mean, so this is creating a file with, with some, with some of the numbers, okay? So, um, yeah, this will pass. Two examples here, okay, this is wonderful. It works. Let's go into integration testing. Well, this is infrastructure as code. Well, yes, because the suggestion you're giving us because infrastructure as code is expressing behavior since it's using a declarative syntax. So you would be duplicating the code you use. No, not necessarily, because basically what you do, for example, when you write a provider, and so this is this is a provider that's already in Chef, and they test it for you. Let's say that you write a provider that um, that actually connects to an HTTP API and stuff like that. So this you actually have to test, and this yeah. is something that you will be using in infrastructure as code. Yeah, but you're doing. In this case, it's code. It is code. Ruby. It is Ruby code. Yeah, that's that's perfectly true. But it actually does run a Chef run, you know, and you get all the environments. You get all the Chef environment. So yeah, it's it's much more close to Ruby than than proper infrastructure. Yeah. That's that's completely true. Yes. However, it is very needed, and it and you can avoid pitfalls really easily. Um, so integration testing, this might be maybe something that um, that you know goes in link, if you will. Um, we will actually build a VM. We will deploy our code on the VM, and we will see if this code will actually be applied. It will. It will have a CentOS six point seven box. We'll be using Chef Zero, which is kind of an in-memory Chef server, and uh, and it will run our cookbook using background to build the VM. Will this fail? There is no one saying yes. Yes, why, will, why would it fail? Why will it fail? Because uh, I don't see any render recipe. Oh no. The render, it's uh, like when you do when you do this in Chef, it actually gets default by by automatically. So it runs default on RV. Pardon? The sum is not six. One plus two plus no no. That's that's that was Chef spec. No no, we're done with that. This will actually just put put the damn thing. Will it fail? Pardon? The attribute is not set. That is true. But now we know that the tests that that the tests will pass even though the attributes are not set. It will create an empty file. 
you will love this one. It will fail. Because the enclosing directory doesn't exist. Really because I said that I want a TMP render file, and there is no TMP render directory. I mean, come on, we're creating a file, people. <laughs> but this happens. This, this, this happens more often than you actually want to admit. And then you have to say, OK, so I want a directory, and I want this to be recursive, so I'm sure, absolutely sure, that this directory will be created. And then it will actually pass. And this will pass, this will converge, you know, Chef. And here we're actually kind of relying on the fact that, oh yeah, you know, I believe that Chef will actually converge. And that Chef will do this for me. But you actually don't know if the file really is there. So for this you need cert spec. If you want to really test your state in the server. So we, it's also root, it's also an extension to our spec. We say require server spec, we set the backend to exec, basically, you know, execute something. And then we describe a file, TMP render file, and it should be a file, and its size should be nil. Well, it should be zero, actually. Will this fail? It actually won't. This is perfect. So this is OK. Server spec is actually the only one that does guarantee you that your file is actually there, because it, it actually checks in the code if your file is there. Why would you use server spec and not rely on, okay, on, and not rely on Chef in, in its entirety? Well, let me give you an example. Let's say that you're running a Mesos, a Mesos cluster, and you spawn up the Mesos slave. And this, this uh, Mesos slave is using a supervisor called Upstart. And what you do is you say, OK, I want this service to be up. And then Chef sends a command to Upstart, and Upstart will go just return saying, yes, I started the service. Wonderful, I'm done. And then you go on the machine and you see that the damn service is actually not started because you misconfigured it. But what happened is upstart, you know, respawned it three times in like five minutes or whatever it does by default, and then it fails. But Chef doesn't know this because Chef started and upstart said, oh, no, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm perfectly fine. But you're not fine. And this is why I have to test. This is why you have to actually send API requests to the Meso slave HTTP port. Otherwise, you are not sure that your server is in the state that you want it to be in. And let's go a step further, um, actually using the Mesos uh, example, and let's do a little bit of functional testing. So what we'll do is we will actually um, set up a multi-node setup in background. So this is our configuration. It will, again, send to 6.7. We will have a master and slave. The master will be connected to a private network. It will run the Mesos master using these attributes. So this only sets the IP, nothing, nothing more. And then the slave, it's absolutely the same. You connect it to the same private network, and it just you know, said it's OK to you know, connect to the master, whatever. It works. And then you have a Berks file. Berks file is basically the file where uh, the, is actually the, the, the command line utility that will actually get all the cookbook dependencies, dependencies for you from the Chef supermarket and then it will put it, in, put it into the VM. Okay? So what we want to test here is um, if these two machines are up, I want to test that if I have a master and if I have a slave, I want to shut down my meso slave I want to do a test on the master to see if the slave actually unregistered from the master, and then I want to bring the slave back up. And I want to do this automatically, because I am never absolutely sure that the functional test will pass with my configuration until I actually test the damn thing. And I'm not going to test in pre-prod, because it's too expensive. Because people rely on pre-prod. People actually rely on the fact that pre-prod is kind of you know open bar where they can test and we have something like, you know, around 50 or 60 or 70 or whatever applications in pre where, you know, developers just put their code. Usually crappy code. <laughs> because it's pre so they can do it. And this will actually do this for you. So it's called Infotester. And it will connect to the master on port 5050 slash state. And this is just a simple, uh, it's, it's a simple get request to get back a JSON. 
And then in the JSON, you just check if the activated slaves is zero, which basically means that the slave unregistered. Now you don't have a register save on the master. It finishes also really, really fast. It, it just takes a long time to finish. Yeah, it takes around um, three minutes, like per box, if you do virtual box. But if you do LXC, it goes even faster. And if you really want to like make sure that this works on every single machine you have uh, as a developer from Windows to whatever, then you can actually spin a, a, a virtual box and then inside you spin LXCs. And this is what we have done for console. So console is actually tested by, via Jepson. Uh, so they do it internally, we don't have the tests. So we can you know, only rely on HashiCorp's word that, you know, oh, you know, it, it's fine, network petitioning, you know, no, it'll work, it'll work. Well, it doesn't, you know? So we actually hit a bug where if you build up uh, three masters in one data center, three masters in the other data, data center, with, with a slave in each data center, and then what you do with InfraTester, you pick the ones which are masters in both data, center, data centers, and you kill them. And then all hell breaks loose, because it doesn't work. Unless you upgrade to console 0.6.3, which is the latest one, then it actually works. In 0.5.1 it was broken. But that's when we build the test. And that's when you go like, yeah, I should probably upgrade console to the latest version. Fun times. Uh, by the way, this is the Mesos master log. And you can actually see that the slave does get disconnected. That I do have an HTTP GET request from InfoTester. And then the slave gets put back in.